this episode of The Atlas Society Asks. I'm Jennifer Grossman. My friends know me as JAG. I am CEO of The Atlas Society, which is the leading nonprofit philosophy organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand. Today, we are joined by my friend, uh, John Tierney. And before I even get into introducing John, I wanna remind all of you that are joining us on Zoom that you can ask your questions, just type them into the Q&A box. I think we've gotten the hang of that by now. Or if you are joining us on YouTube, just type them into the comment section. We will get to as many of them as possible. So John is a best-selling science writer and speaker. He is the best-selling author of several books, including most recently, The Power of Bad, which explores the brain's bias for negativity um, and uh, the impacts of that bias and provides strategies to overcome our wiring to focus on the worst. He is a contributing editor to City Journal, the quarter quarterly publication of the Manhattan Institute. Uh, during his many years at the New York Times, Tierney was a science columnist, an op-ed columnist, and staff writer for the Times Magazine. He is also a newlywed, having won the heart and hand of one of our previous webinar guests, Helen Fisher. John, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for inviting me, Jennifer. I am such a fan of you and the Atlas Society, really just fighting the good fight. <laughs> I'm happy to contribute. Spectacular. So, um, of course, so much has changed since, uh, since we were able last to meet in person, although I'm really thrilled that uh, we've been able to connect um, with both you and Helen on our, our regular uh, happy hours, not so happy hours. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that is going on for so many right now is we've lost trust in a lot of our um, institutions. Uh, especially with, with COVID um, and the way that uh, politicians have handled it. So um, you have been writing about the lack of science in the decisions by politicians on how to handle uh, the pandemic. What science um, are they ignoring or, or failing to incorporate? Um, it's become this politicized science, you know, it, it's a problem that I've written about in City Journal about the left's war on science, which is the real war on science. And people talk about right wingers being opposed to it, but really all the, just about all the pressure to distort it comes from the left. And th there are so many other previous examples, but this really showed it where before the pandemic, the expert, you know, there were no expert recommendations for lockdown. People considered that the harms would outweigh the benefits. This was not what the CDC, what the uh, WHO did. And then suddenly during this pandemic, I think, you know, partly in response to Trump, partly in response to China, that became suddenly the accepted solution. Um, and there was, and, and so anyone who opposed that, it, you know, was vilified, became hard to publish papers on, um, um, on this, you know, anything questioning the narratives that lockdowns were the right thing. You know, Scott Atlas, you know, finally Trump, you know, brought in Scott Atlas from the Hoover Institution, who would you'd actually looked at, you know, what are the lives lost due to lockdowns versus the lives saved? And, but he was vilified for it. His colleagues at Stanford, you know, wrote a letter denouncing him. But these other scientists who did the Great Barrington Declaration, trying to, you know, you know, to take a different look at this, they were also vilified. The media was, would do hit pieces on them. And, it, and you know, and, and I've been hearing from a lot of scientists who, you know, that if you publish anything suggesting that, that we really don't have much evidence, you know, after nine months now, we still don't really have evidence that lockdowns do any good. Um, and, and yet it's hard to publish that. It's hard to get that message out. And, and, you know, that's unfortunately, you know, what's going on in so much of science today. You know, my co-author on, on, uh, on the power of bad, Roy Baumeister, he, you know, he's, he's one of the most cited social psychologists in the world. And, he's really worried about what's happening in his field where it's very hard to publish anything that counters any of the progressive narratives about what men and women are like, what you know, societies are like. So it's a real threat to science. So, um, and I wanna encourage those joining us on Zoom and on YouTube to uh, take advantage of this opportunity and get, send some questions our way, uh, keep them pithy if you can. 
for uh, John Tierney. So John, I, I recently reread, we listened to uh, your book in one of the most salient chapters, uh, I believe chapter nine it was called the crisis crisis. And you suggest uh, that when we see a crisis, we make three um, assumptions. One, the world will always seem to be in crisis. Two, the crisis is never as bad as it sounds. And three, the solution could easily make things worse. Well, help correct my negativity <laughs> bias uh, here, but uh, it seems that if ever there was a crisis last week uh, with the violence and the break-in at our nation's capital, that would qualify as a crisis. Um, is it not, does your, your premise still apply? And uh, also what are some of the ways in which the quote unquote, you know, solutions, deplatforming people, cancel culture, impeachment uh, could actually potentially make the, the problem worse? Well, um, uh, the capital crisis, I, I mean, it is a crisis when you see people that day going into the capital, it's a horrible spectacle. Um, but it's also a great example of how we overreact to crises and make things worse. Because, I mean, the antecedents for this really came, you know, two things last year. One was this series of riots in response to a supposed crisis in, in police shootings of Blacks, when in fact, you know, the long-term friends all showed exactly the opposite. But that sort of normalized in, uh, street violence. And, you know, so that it intimidated the police from doing anything. They were vilified for, you know, for anything they did against the protesters. So that's one antecedent. The other antecedent is Trump creating this crisis of that he won by a landslide and there's massive um, electoral vote fraud in, in amplifying that. So you get these two, you know, the, um, this very heated atmosphere. And then, you know, then he assembles this, you know, this crowd and then some of them you know, do go in the Capitol. Now, it was a terrible thing that happened. It was awful to watch. Um, and the cooler response would have been, well, at least at this point, we have Democrats and Republicans agreeing that mob the street violence is wrong, no matter what mm -hmm. the cause, and that, and that we should, you know, take steps. And, and really, riots are police problems. You know, we learned that from the 60s. There was all this talk about, oh, you have to deal with the underlying issues. And then Rudy Giuliani showed in New York, no, you, you know, no, that, you know, riots are a police problem. And, and we hadn't learned that at the Capitol. So, in, so instead of actually saying, yes, let's prosecute the people who did this, that'll be a huge disincentive for this to happen again. Instead, uh, um, we've got this one, uh, the left now is just terribly amplifying this thing, calling it a coup, an insurrection, that it was some threat to democracy. No, it was never that. I mean, they, you know, they, it, it was a horrible spectacle. They didn't stop Joe Biden from being um, named president and, and, and they never had any chance of doing so. And so we get in response to that, it's being used as an excuse to further inflame passions. And, and, and now it's leading to some real long-term problems and that we're starting to see sense, you know, that it's being used as an excuse for censorship on social media, which is a horrible thing to see. And that will probably lead to a kind of reaction when the Republicans come back in power, they're gonna wanna, you know, you know, you know somehow regulate social media, we'll have government and, and it'll be very hard to do that without further endangering free speech. So that's the case where um, we've inflated the crisis, we've hyped it, and the solution is gonna make things worse. So how do uh, who you call the merchants of bad, tell us who are the merchants of bad and how do they aggravate um, these problems? Well, you're looking at one. I mean, journalists, you know, journalists and politicians are the two main players, plus a lot of um, activists and talking heads, you know, and we all make uh, make a living by, you know, by appealing to people's negativity bias. The easiest way to get attention, as we say in the power of bad, is to uh, bad things have much more impact. So politicians know that demonizing the opposition, negative ads work a lot better than positive ads. You know, you know, TV producers know that if it leads, it bleeds. So we're always looking for a way to hype this. You know, I, I tell a story about my first, as an intern in Philadelphia, I was assigned to do a weather story during a heat wave. And I managed to, you know, by finding one policeman who said it was the worst traffic he ever saw, I turned this into the beach traffic crisis that we, you know, suddenly the roads were overwhelmed. It's really easy to create crises as a journalist. Now I've tried not to do that since, but, um, 
it, it's also, but there's this huge incentive for journalists and politicians to go negative because you get more attention more quickly that way. And there's a huge incentive for experts in a field, for academics, activists, to hype whatever their, their cause is. Could be, you know, and there isn't much incentive for anyone to debunk alarmists. Nobody gives you research grants. Nobody runs your story you know, uh, at the top of the homepage for saying something isn't a problem. Um, or that maybe you know, the long-term trend is actually good here. This is an isolated example. Um, so that's, you know, it's this basic sort of collective action problem where these special interests are exploiting our negativity bias. They're hyping crises, creating this false view of the world. And there isn't much incentive on the other side to debunk them and, sh and, and show people that really most things are, are getting better in the world. Um, well, one of those issues that uh, is, is frequently the subject of alarmism is that, of course, of uh, overpopulation. Um, the fact that since Malthus, uh, people have been predicting that population growth would outstrip resources um, uh, to, to meet the needs of the population, yet time and again, that has proven false. So uh, why is this belief so, so persistent? You know, Bill Tucker, the, the late Bill Tucker, one of my favorite writers in it, he said there have always been two successful forms of demagoguery. One is telling poor people that rich people have too much money. And the other is telling rich people that there are too many poor people. And it's amazing how this population crisis, as you say, Mal you know, Malta started it. You know, the, uh, the population growth would outstrip food supply. He was proven dramatically wrong in the 19th century and the early 20th. Yet it just got repeated. There was a whole wave of population crisis mongering in the 40s. There was the you know, these best-selling books called the, uh, uh, the, Road to, uh, the Road to Survival. And then again in the 60s, a whole new wave by Paul Ehrlich, you know, the, the population bomb and, and these other crises. And, you know, predicting that billions of people would starve to death in the 1980s and because of a global famine. And, you know, the amazing thing is that, you know, none of this happened. Um, you know, once again, as ever, the long-term trend, food supply grows faster than population growth. Um, you know, people are better fed than ever now. Uh, um, and yet, you know, there's so, you know, there's so little penalty for uh, uh, the doomsayers. I mean, you know, Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren, uh, you know, who was then I think at uh, Berkeley or Stanford, you know, they, they put out this ecology textbook with these horrifying proposals for how to stop the population crisis. You know, one of them was uh, uh, that women throughout the world should be implanted with a sterilizing device when they reach puberty. And this could only be removed with official, quote, official permission. Now, um, it, it was terrible this happened. And, and, and this whole intellectual movement in the West led to terrible consequences in, you know, in Latin America and Asia, where there were tens of millions of women who were sterilized, often forcibly. Um, there are millions of women, there were tens of millions of forced abortions in China. And yet, you know, Holdren and Ehrlich, you know, continue to be treated as if they're actually experts. In fact, Holdren was, you know, he was appointed Obama's science advisor. And barely anyone even mentions these failed predictions he made before. So it's a very frustrating thing that, you know, how you can keep making this mistake and there's no penalty for it. We just don't learn from our mistakes. So uh, I want to remind all of you watching to ask your questions. I promise I will get to them. Um, you know, as you said, of course, it was, it, it's been a, a challenging week uh, and with no help from the merchants of bad um, <laughs> and, uh, and this, this kind of uh, tribalism and, and polarization. Um, so I want to, you know, what, what are we supposed to do? Just kind of put our heads under the, uh, the cover I think it is important to you know continue to stand up for one's beliefs despite you know the the consequences or damn the consequences and um, have courage. But also I think it's important to focus on those areas where we do have greater agency, where we do have greater control, and one of those is our personal relationships. Of course, you are married to the uh, the nation's leading relationship uh, expert, Helen Fisher. Um, but you also write in your book, The Power of Bad, how um, the negativity bias can sabotage relationships and also how 
uh, the different genders um, may have a different way of being um, being sabotaged or manipulated or uh, made more vulnerable to their their makeup. So uh, tell us a little bit about that and whether or not you've managed to use some of those, put some of those uh, principles into practice in your own life. Um, well, certainly. Uh, well, of course, Helen is a perfect wife, so I don't really have to worry about anything bad. But um, uh, our chapter in The Power of Bad about relationships, we talk about how when they track marriages over, you know, and psychologists have done this to see which you know, relationships succeed and which don't. What they find is that the good stuff, you, you, know, how, you know, how passionately in love you are at the beginning, um, you know, the positive attributes don't matter nearly. It's the bad stuff that dooms a relationship. I mean, in the book, we talk about the rule of four, which is, and this is, it's a very rough guide, but it's based on a lot of studies that in general, bad things have at least three times as much impact as, as a comparable good thing. So I'd always keep out doing it by, you know, four to one ratio if you can do that. And, and in relationships, you know, that's what tends to happen is that um, once one per, you know, once something bad happens, someone, it, it, the key in a relationship is not to, is not to respond and escalate because that's the classic. You know, and, and we talk about this novel, uh, He Knew He Was Right by Trollope, which is a great example of this one thing goes bad in an otherwise perfect marriage. And they both just keep, you know, escalating and escalating in response and it all falls apart. So that's really crucial. You know, women, um, uh, women experience you know, more negative emotions than men do. And, uh, um, and, and so women are more likely to, you know, to find something that's bothering them in the relationship. The problem with men is that they often tend to withdraw. And then that tends to just escalate things instead of actually confronting the problem. So, you know, our advice is, is not to follow the golden rule, which is, you know, do unto others as they would do unto you, but it's really much more important what you don't do unto others is avoiding bad things in a relationship is much more important and when something does go wrong you know try to give your partner the benefit of the doubt you know that the don't assume that it's some character flaw that, or that it's not it's because they don't love you try to think maybe there were circumstances that caused that try to do that and try to also take an outsider's perspective or bring in an outsider because outsiders are not as you know as susceptible of that negativity bias they can look at it more rationally whereas we tend to react you know, very viscerally when we feel that we're being wronged. Yeah, I, th I thought that was really interesting in your discussion of, um, of that novel in which you were saying the frustration and the tragedy was that there were outsiders, that there were friends that were trying to step in, that were trying to, to help them. And yet they persisted in, uh, in just feeling that they were right and the other one was wrong. And ruined you know uh, uh, yeah the heroine i mean the best advice in the novel the heroine's sister you know the heroine is upset at the way her husband treat you know uh, um uh, suspected or treated her and he had the group but the, you know the sister just says if he didn't mean anything if i were you i would forget it and that would have saw you know and because it was a one-time thing but it's just a ruin it, you know it ended up ruining the marriage so uh, another gr great quote from your book is, uh, quote, what experts lack in accuracy, they make up in confidence and exaggeration. Have you seen examples of that, you know, particularly with coronavirus or, or other aspects from, uh, from experts in, yeah. in the past year? Yeah, certainly. I mean, a classic, you know, there's a classic rule among, among you know, columnists and pundits is, uh, the way to have a successful career is, is to follow the philosophy, often wrong, never in doubt. <laughs> that, you know, that works as long as you're very assertive and, and more dramatic. But I mean, one example of COVID was that early in the pandemic, they were, you know, Andrew Cuomo, uh, the governor of New York, was warning that we were going to need 150,000 hospital beds in New York for the COVID patients, which is, you know, three times the capacity. And the actual number, the peak number was less than 20,000. You know, and, and this has been a pattern across the country. They keep saying the hospitals are being overwhelmed. We have to lock down. If you actually look at, you know, uh, at trends, often it's, it's the case in the UK and everywhere else, you know, that hospitals do get busier in the fall when flu season comes. And that happens every year. And if you often look at these lockdowns that happen, even when hospitals are below average, and then the consequence of this sort of thing is that in New York, because we had this ridiculous prediction of, of the hospitals being overwhelmed, it, it's off partially by an order of magnitude, uh, that 
uh, the hospital said, well, you have to let us release our patients. We're all going to be overwhelmed. You have to let us release our patients. And so, and so the state ordered nursing homes to take in COVID patients. And that, of course, led to thousands of deaths in nursing homes. So it's, that's another example of the solution makes things worse. Yeah, actually, we had Phil Kirpin um, on this webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was last week. And uh, he, he has a prediction that actually the lockdowns probably um, doubled uh, as much as doubled the, uh, the death rate because um, so many of these hasty decisions, wrong decisions um, were made and, uh, and they had disastrous, uh, disastrous um, consequences. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a few questions. I wanna take one um, from Tanner uh, Smedley. He says, if we look at the Mal if we look at this in a Malthusian way, because we're talking about overpopula uh, overpopulation, uh, geometric progression, are we on track for nine billion people by 2050? Do we truly fear, feel there is no breaking point? Um, you know, look, um, I have not followed the projections lately. I know, I mean, the experts now tend to be more worried that uh, the population growth is slowing so much that we're not gonna have enough young people to take care of, uh, of older people, not enough workers to pay into social security, things like that. Um, certainly the, you know, the long-term pattern is, you know, people have always worried that we're gonna outstrip the earth's resources. In fact, as Julian Simon and others have pointed out, you know, resources have been getting more and more plentiful that, you know, that, you know, the old saying that, you know, that each new mouth comes attached to two hands and that we're so ingenious at creating more resources. You know, we're actually, there's far more nature now. People, uh, you know, all, the, all this farmland is reverting to forest and, and, and to nature because our farmers are so efficient. There's not going to be any shortage of natural resources or food. You know, we, we have more of that than ever. We're getting better and better at it. Um, you know, I, I'm much more worried about other about the crisis prices leading to um, basically so much overreaction that, uh, 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 that it's going to stop us from innovating or slow us from innovating and not enable us to respond. I mean, there are always going to be new problems, but you know, we have the capacity to deal with it as long as we can, you know, as long as we're free to do that. So in your book, uh, John, you discuss the chicken and fox analogy where chicken little thinks the sky is falling. Uh, what is the warning for us in that story that's relevant to what we're going through now? Well, chicken little, you know, she was quite sincere and doomsayers often are quite sincere. They really believe that the sky is falling, but her solution was to lead the frightened animals into for shelter in, in the den of the fox. And uh, so by overreacting to an imagined crisis, he creates a real one. And that, that just happens so often. Um, you know, in the book, we have lots of examples. A classic one that certainly libertarians know, know is the, um, the current opioid crisis, which is the same story as the whole war on drugs. That, you know, we, you know there are always people who are, you know, who are subject to, to uh, who are prone to substance abuse, but we treat each new thing as, oh my God, this is an unprecedented crisis. If we just ban whatever this new substance is, opioid prescriptions or, um, you know, crack, methamphetamine, whatever it is, uh, that'll solve the problem. And the long-term thing, is, is what happens once you ban something is the drug dealers start making, you know, the, uh, the street prices have been coming down for decades. The drugs are more available than ever. And they're also more compact and more dangerous than ever because that's the black market encourages you to make smaller, more compact things like bathtub gin that replaced beer during prohibition. And so the net result of the war on drugs has been an increase in drug overdoses. And that's what's happened in the opioid crisis that, you know, we severely, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. severely restricted opioid uh, uh, prescriptions. They have declined by 40% in the past decade. Meanwhile, so people have just, it's made it much harder for people with chronic pain to get treatment. There are 50 million Americans like that. And, but the people who have been abusing opioids, they, you know, it hasn't stopped them. They had just switched to fentanyl and heroin. So while the, the drug prescriptions have declined by 40%, um, the overdose deaths have more than doubled. And, you know, that's the classic case of just making things worse. So uh, I have a few more questions. I wanna encourage again, everyone who is joining us on Zoom and on YouTube to bring the questions to, to John Tierney 
Uh, Roger Hoffman has a question. He wants to know whether you think most professors at today's universities are really true scientists. I guess, Roger, you're referring to uh, the professors of science. Um, well, it does depend on what field you're in, I guess. Uh, I mean, I think most, you know, academics, I mean, they are trained and they do, um, you know, most people are responsible. The problem has been that in some fields, especially the social sciences, they're, um, they may be trained well in science, but there's, you know, they're, they're blinded by their own bias and that there's so much groupthink going on there that, you know, in some fields like sociology that, you know, they're more, they're more Marxist than there are Republicans. You know, there's this overwhelming, and, and you know, um, I've written about this, Jonathan Haidt has, about the ratios, it's, you know, 10 to one, five to one of, of uh, liberals to conservatives, and, they, and, and it's been getting more and more extreme. And so they get blinded basically by their own bias, but they never hear any other point of view. So that's just a basic problem. And, and we know, I mean, that's the, uh, the whole point of peer review is to have, uh, is to have outside, um, outside experts look at your thing, people with a different point of view, critique your work. But in the social sciences today, it's getting harder and harder to find anyone who has a different point of view. And then, you know, we've got this whole problem with cancel culture of the left, basically trying to suppress anything that, that interferes with the narrative. And, you know, I did a piece, as I said, for City Journal called The Real War on Science. And they're just example after example of, you know, things that can't be said. You can't study IQ anymore. You can't, you know, you can't report gender differences without, you know, worrying about endangering your career. These things are all becoming taboo. And, and, and you know, and the biggest effect in some ways is that it discourages anyone from even looking into these fields. You know, you know, that's a career killer if I, if I report that. And, um, you know, my, my work's not going to get published. I won't get tenure. So it's really discouraging people from looking into topics and, and it pushes people into, you know, um, topics and into kind of projects that will come up with results that will please the prevailing progressive narrative. So uh, Larry Borland says, uh, cens censoring from the media uh, is a major threat to freedom. This assumes that alternative modes are restricted from arising. Um, I, I guess, not sure what the question is in there, uh, Larry may clarify, but, but how does some of the social media dynamics uh, feed into and contribute to, uh, to the power of God? Well, um, it, it makes it easier for, you know, for people to attack, you know, the, this cancel culture. And again, you know, with the negativity effect, the bad things are so much more you know, that it's very easy to get quick attention and, you know, and one attack on someone, you know, that uh, it's, it's much easier. Um, and, and in the book, we said ex experiments about this, how it's much easier to get a bad reputation uh, than a good reputation. And once you get a bad reputation, it's much harder to shape. So people are, are understandably very afraid of anything negative about them. And one accusation makes a big difference and social media makes it easy to do that. Now, I'm not is down on social media. We have a book, uh, you know, part of the book, debunking some of the hysteria or you know the fears about social media that's leading to all these awful things. Um, and now it, it it does make cancel culture possible. It does make it possible to spread conspiracy theories very quickly. Um, but it also it's actually less negative than mass media. You know, because the easiest way to get mass attention is to appeal to these common fears we all have of foreigners of um, of contagion, you know, these basic visceral fears. And the mass media instinctively goes for these fears. And social media, people are less likely to share with their friends a picture of a school shooting. You know, they, people share more positive things with, each, with one another. Um, and I mean, you see on the most emailed list of the New York Times, the stuff that actually does well, like science articles, you know, uplifting stories about nature, about, or, you know, about cosmology, that sort of thing. So in that sense, there's hope in social media if you can, you know, use it correctly. But it certainly does make it easier for those very quick attacks on, on, on cancel culture. Have you, John, uh, experienced that um, with your own work? I mean, you really coming from the New York Times uh, and having um, a uh, a lot of people who tended to see things in in one way took a lot of you know, guts of you, John Stossel, to say, you know, I, I, I see things differently. Have, have, have you had a progression? Had, had you always had this 
point of view or did was there a process um i mean i mean college i think i I think I was always a libertarian in my heart, but I didn't realize that I think I was more of a conventional liberal in college. And it was actually journalism that kind of turned me into a libertarian because I it was by going out and reporting and talking to people and seeing how government programs with what impact they actually had, you know, seeing how the market actually worked. So, you know, that that was really what convinced me. And so, you know, like on the population crisis, I went to this village in Africa to see what had happened. That ten years earlier there'd been a documentary about you know they were all going to starve to death, and I went there. And, well, actually, they were doing better. So, you know, it was learning that. But in that, but as far as at the time, yeah, it, it was tough. And when I started writing an op-ed column there, you know, Al Hahn, who who wrote a, li- uh, he was a liberal who wrote for the Wall Street Journal. He was like, you know, their token liberal. And he said to me, you know, it's a great gig, you know, to be in there because they keep you honest when you're writing for um, a hostile audience. You have to be, you know, accurate. But his one piece of advice was don't read the mail, you know, <laughs> and... That's what I found because, you know, I, I was there kind of at this, you know, um, um, when the comments on my stories, it was, I mean, I, I really did have to stop reading them because you get overcome by the negativity effect. I was amazed there was a whole group of people who, who like whenever I wrote a column would kind of convene there to just talk about how awful I was. And, you know, and I was wondering, well, why don't you just read someone else? But it was obviously they enjoyed it. And the most common comment, you know, throughout my career at the time and all my articles is always, I cannot believe the New York Times allows this person to write, you know? So, you, I mean, it toughens you a little bit. And you know, one piece of advice we have in, in, in the book is, you know, because we all have to deal with negative comments on social media now, because you're in business, is have someone else read your comments, you know, because the bad ones just affect you so strongly. And, and there's some useful criticism in it, and criticism is the best way to learn. That's the power of bad. You, you learn a lot more from mistakes, but, have someone else filter it for you, keep the good stuff and try to keep that four to one ratio of good to bad. So you don't get too demoralized. I, I like that. Um, and I think the other thing is to remind yourself that uh, that sometimes it actually benefits your algorithm and people that uh, really don't like you or are uh, just, you're not gonna please them on anything. The, their, their engagement, and believe me, the Atlas Society has plenty of, of critics actually boosts the visibility of, of the content that we uh, produce. Yeah. So um, we are honored to actually have uh, our chairman of the board of the Atlas Society, Jay LaPere, uh, <laughs> who just submitted a question. And I think you've, you've, met, uh, you've met Jay. He asks, is there a correlation between the habits and mindsets advocated by positive psychology and open-mindedness, objectivity, and a commitment to truth. Um, yes, you know, there's been this idea that uh, it's called the broaden and build. I mean, just, you know, personally, there's been a lot of research into which people are happier and they, by tracking their emotions during the day and, you know, how many negative emotions they have, how many positive. And they've even done, and showing that people who have more positive emotions tend to see things more broadly. It's called, in fact, the, the, the broaden and build, I think, idea that they've even done experiments that, that when you're in a, a positive mood, you actually see that you've got a wider field of vision when you do that. And I think, you know, positivity does help you see the world much more accurately than, than this constricted view of negativity where you're withdrawing and protecting yourself instead of, you know, looking at how things, um, um, might hurt you and and so we do you know and there is you know the one bit of good news is that there's a thing called the positivity effect which is that we have kind of natural ways for, for overcoming negativity one thing that they've they've studied it's called the pollyanna principle that they noticed that um and and, and this has been has been observed you know in these studies of, of millions and millions of words used by people in novels and movies we use a lot more positive words than negative words. The, you know, the negative words have more impact. Um, and there are more negative words than positive words because we've got lots of different ways to describe each bad thing. There are fewer positive, but we use the positive ones more often. And there are techniques, and we call them in the book glad games, you know, that we borrowed from positive psychology and other places for accentuating the positive. And that's where you've really got to use your the rational brain, that prefrontal cortex overcome those ancient fears, you, you know, those ancient brain circuits that respond to fear. And by engaging in things like, you know, a gratitude diary, by learning to focus, uh, you know, on the positive, 
it, it gives you a much more accurate view of the world and, and, and it does make you more broad minded, I think, and I think much more effective that way that, you know, the positive people tend to, you know, tend to achieve much more. We've got about 20 more minutes. So I want to encourage those who are joining us on Zoom and on YouTube to, uh, to submit your questions for Don Tierney. Um, what, you know, what you just said about gratitude, I know that's a big theme that, uh, that Jay and our trustees have, um, have really pressed us to explore and which we uh, dramatized in our Draw My Life, My Name is Gratitude. Um, taking a look at it from an objectivist, uh, rationally self-interested point of view. And uh, what, one of the things we discovered was that when you, it's, it's not just a, a principle of justice, of acknowledging the good things in your life, not just a principle of, of being reality based, but it's also very empowering because when you are in resentment, when you feel that other people have taken advantage of you or that are doing wrong by you, uh, you, you tend to feel smaller. Um, and, and when you expand your sense of, of the positive things in your life and your, um, your control over them, you just have a greater sense of agency. That, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the, you know, the, um, um, the, and it also just jives with, I mean, Ayn Rand's, you know, you know, um, ideas that government, you know, people turn to government when they feel small and they feel victimized and, and, and you know, and it's always been the classic strategy of, of Marxists to, you know, we have to have an agreed class. It has to be these victims who, are, who have no agency, who can't save themselves, and we have to save them. And so we'll get the government and then, you know, now in the, in, in, you know, in modern campuses, it's, it, you know, it, it's the intersectional groups that, that have no agency really, that have to be rescued by everyone else. And, you know, I mean, it becomes a rationale for all kinds of, of control over people's lives and, and ways to, um, so, and it's, it, you know, and it's such a classic case. You know, Aitzel Mencken has a quote about the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed by, by menacing them with an endless series of hobgoblins. And, you know, that's the classic way that it happens. You know, that's, that's what, and, and that's one of the major um, goals of crisis monitoring. You know, I, I, I've written about um, Robert Higgs, you know, who, and his classic book, uh, Crisis and Leviathan, that where he studied that government tends to grow, it, it doesn't grow slowly, it grows in spurts whenever there's a crisis, when there's a war, military establishment expands. And when there's a crisis of some kind, we, you know, we expand social services to respond to some, some supposed crisis. And, and he talks about the ratchet effect that, you know, once you do that, once it grows, it never goes back. So, and that sets a long-term problem, I think, for, you know, for people to, because it, it, it's very frustrating to watch how, how Leviathan just, it just keeps ratcheting up and it never gets turned back. The military establishment never goes back to its previous size. And mm -hmm. uh, um, so. So would you say, John, that the bigger problem is um, a public, uh, an alarmed, frightened, um, or in, in some cases, uh, uh, what we would call um, wanting something for nothing, uh, public, more uh, demanding action from government, or is it government seizing on crises to uh, to increase its power? That is, are the driving real driving factors? Um, I think it's both, but it's mainly government seizing power. I mean, I think people do when something bad happens, when it gets you know um, um, turned into a crisis by the media. I'm sure there are people now. I'm sure there are people genuinely saying, "Oh my God, you know, the countries there's going to be a civil war unless." You know, unless we impeach Trump immediately, and unless we um, have Twitter and everyone, you know, shut down every, you know, all these, you know, parlor and all these social, there probably are people who believe that. But you know, when they do studies about these things, when there's a school shooting, suddenly we've got this. Oh, we've got to have gun control. But that tends to die down pretty quickly. And you know, the, there's a very short term, and, and, and politicians try to exploit that. And I think what really goes on is that the merchants of bad, these special interests are very well organized to exploit crises, that there are always these, these groups that, that are gonna benefit, you know, activist groups will benefit, there'll be some industries that benefit from it, there'll be bureaucracies that benefit from it, there are politicians who benefit by getting attention, publicity, campaign contributions, and more budgets to hand the dole out to people. 
So they, it's really them seizing that opportunity to do it. And, you know, the, and it's bad enough what they do in the short term, you know, as far as, you know, the money that's wasted on it and some of the perverse consequences. But the biggest long-term problem is, is what Mansur Olson, the economist, called demosclerosis, which is, it's not one big, terrible consequence. It's the, it's the accumulation of all, it's the hardening of the economic arteries. And, and I think he did a great book on uh, the wealth of nations showing that, you know, he argued that it was the biggest single problem affecting nations, even though you can't really see it. It's death by a thousand cuts, that you just get this, you know, these special interests get more and more regulations, more subsidies, um, more, um, you know, it's labor unions, it's companies, it's, it's you know, it's, it's bureaucracies growing, and it just, it all slowly just, and it and it's all works against new people. It works against innovators because it makes it that much harder. I mean, we've seen it in COVID where, I mean, why did it, it, it became obvious early in the epidemic with the test for COVID that the FDA, you know, and, CD, and CDC, which were supposedly set up exactly for the, the CDC was, was set up exactly for this emergency. And they've been so diverted by so many other things that they, you know, have not focused on it. The FDA is supposed to ensure that we get safe drugs. And yet they were the biggest obstacle to developing a COVID test was getting it approved. And the vaccine, you know, people pointed out that if, if there were no FDA, if, if Merck had, um, um, had been able to just offer a vaccine to people to see you know, who wants to take it, we would have had results much sooner on this. We would have had all these volunteers taking the vaccine. We would have had results. It would have all happened much quicker. And that's the kind of slowdown in innovation. And it makes everything so much more expensive. You know, the cost of developing new drugs has, has just increased um, by some estimates, it's three to six billion dollars to create one new drug now. It's just gone up so much faster than inflation. And, and we pay for this, you know, it's, it's slowing us down and developing drugs for Alzheimer's. And it, but, and it isn't one thing, it's just this accretion that we, you know, that we keep reacting to each new problem as a crisis and we have to do something to solve it. And then we put something in place and when it's no longer necessary, when it doesn't work at all, it stays in place. And so that's the demosclerosis problem. So putting your advice into, into practice uh, and, you know, taking a step back from uh, our critique and our focus on all of the bad things that, that have happened in this past year. And there have been plenty of bad things and it's not meant to, uh, to be sticking one's head in the, in the sand, but out of that sense of gratitude um, and uh, what are, from your perspective, well, of course we know, your wedding, the main family, but uh, but uh, regardless, in your city, in um, in the country, in the world, some, what are some of the things that the good things to come out of uh, what we've experienced over the past year? Well, good things out of the past year. Um, uh, I think quite understand the question. Yeah, you want the good things out of the past year? Yeah, or? yeah. Like so, I mean, we have seen, for example, some streamlining of regulations. Uh, we've seen families that have figured out you know, how to, to, to work uh, more too closely and, and interconnectedly. Um, we've seen uh, a rise of, of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen uh, more, a quicker kind of consequence of, of, of uh, companies now being able to um, relocate or, or uh, employees working Mm -hmm. remotely so that mm -hmm. uh, that these these cities that do have bad policies can't necessarily be insulated from the consequences of their policies. Mm -hmm. So whether on a, a you know personal level or social level, uh, are there some some good things that uh, that this past year has um, has resulted in? No, that's a great point. And it is definitely yes. Um, the um, you know, the past year has been so disruptive and that can be a good thing. You know, in, in Mansur Olson's classic look at why some, you know, you know, uh, uh, economies were stagnating like Britain in the middle of the, of the 20th century. Whereas, you know, and his examples of, of places that, that grew unexpectedly were Japan and Germany because they had these catastrophic wars. And, and, and obviously people didn't expect them to recover and yet you had these economic miracles there, how quickly they recovered and how fast they grew after it. 
And, and he explained it as that it basically the war had, had, had disrupted their power structure, it destroyed all this, you know, that it basically blew apart all that demosclerosis that they had, they got a fresh start. And I think the, the pandemic in some ways has done that because it suddenly, um, I mean, it exposed, you know, the FDA's, you know, this awful bureaucracy that, that people who developed drugs knew how awful it was, but it never got any publicity and suddenly you had a light shining on and saying, look, these guys are getting in the way. They're not solving the problem. They're getting in the way. And, and it also was a great, as you say, about homeschooling. It showed how the educational bureaucracy was, you know, I mean, it really revealed how corrupt it was that they put teachers unions um, over children. And so I, you know, I think that, you know, more people are homeschooling. And, you know, what these people were saying that parents, when they watch their kids do the Zoom classes at home, they saw the awful stuff the kids were learning in school and said, you know, this is, you know, and, 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 and it made people want to find alternative alternatives. And I think, you know, if, for instance, you know, there was this um, demosclerotic problem that there were all these regulations against uh, telemedicine because, you know, the, the mm -hmm, establishment correct. never wants new competition. Um, they always want to restrict new innovations because it always threatens someone in the status quo. So, and, and those regulations got suspended. And I, you know, the optimists, I mean, I am basically optimistic. I, you know, I think that, that we'll figure out a way around things. And I hope that, that, that some of this deregulation and some of these things will stay once people have seen it. You know, I, I did, um, I talked to Bob Higgs, you, you know, the author of Crisis and Leviathan, who, and uh, he was not buying any of this optimism. He said, <laughs> no. Um, he, he, you know, he said, yeah, some of these things might, might stay, but he said, I just think it's going to lead to so many reactions that will, you know, um, you know, this idea of not, uh, that in the long run, it's going to be much worse. And of course, we're seeing, I mean, the whole idea that you lock down society over a very small threat to most people is, it's a very bad precedent. And, you know, people have said that the COVID lockdowns are really a dress rehearsal for climate change, you know regulation because if you are willing to shut down society over this you know really threat that, that is very small threat to most people well something that threatens the planet you can do anything you know we should be willing to destroy the economy for that um so i i do worry about these precedents being set but i i do show your optimism and i think for a lot of people it was fun to work at home it was nice to suddenly get this new freedom people you know and, and people got to know their kids and their spouses and their their families a lot better. So they're, you know, we're, we're an adaptable species and we do make the best of things. We've got a great question uh, from Vicki and she asks, uh, we have really seen an increase in people assuming the worst intentions, the worst motives on those on the other side of let's say a political um, conflict. Uh, is this part of that negativity bias and normal, or is it just more obvious now? And or as it has it increased, do you see fluctuations? Um, I think it's got. Um, it's definitely part of the negativity bias. The easiest way to get attention is, 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 is with something negative, and so that's why it's much more effective politically to, to demonize your opponent and point that out. We now have this new media market, you know, ever since, you know, since cable news, where you've got these different you know, going for different demographics and each one of them just knows it's a great way to get ratings and get and get clicks is by, can you believe what the other side said today? And you find one, I mean, now it's like, I mean, you see on, on, on newscast or on, on Fox or MSNBC, they'll have a, you know, a whole segment on one person that you've never heard of tweeted something outrageous. And that becomes, can you believe that what they're doing that? And there's this um, uh, uh, Moshe Reno, this uh, political scientist, he calls it false polarization, that pe most people actually haven't really changed their views. Most people are still fairly moderate. Their views on basic issues have not changed significantly in, in the past few decades. But what has changed is, the, is this false polarization where we think the other side is more extreme than it is. And the scary thing is that the people who are least informed, who have the most skewed view of what um, the other side is like are the experts. They're journalists and politicians and, and pundits who have this really skewed view of what the, you know, the, in, you know that the average Republican is this horrible racist, um, misogynist, and the, and the typical Democratic voter is a socialist, you know, uh, with no morals or, and, uh, 
So we've got this, you know, this false polarization being driven by that, that, that each of us demonizes the other. And, uh, and we talked about personal relationships um, earlier too, and, they, and there's something that psychologists call the fundamental attribution error, which is when someone else does something wrong, um, if they run, if I run a traffic light, it's because I was distracted or was that, you know, it was, I had a bad day or, you know, or something. And, and there was a, there was a situational excuse for it. When someone else runs a traffic light, it's, oh, what a terrible driver. And so, and, and, and it's called the fundamental attribution error because you're attributing that mistake to something fundamental in them. So it's their character. It's there's something wrong with them instead of maybe it was just circumstances. And, and so, and that's an error that we, that it, it only goes a negative way. We, we don't attribute, you know, when someone else gets, you know, gets an A, we don't say, um, oh, necessarily, oh, they must be a great student. We might say, oh, well, they just fell lucky or something. So it tends to go, you know, and so we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We don't give it to other people. And in relationships, that's very deadly. You know, we advise people, if, if someone did something that offended you, don't assume it's because they don't love you. Don't assume that they're naturally a selfish, awful person. Maybe they were late for dinner because there was a crisis at the office. You know, maybe it was just something beyond their control. And I think that gets played out in politics when, you know, when a politician says something um, on the other side, says something that sounds terrible. Maybe it's not that he's really, you know, a terrible person, uh, but it's he just said something wrong. But, you know, you know, that's how the, the merchants of bad make a living is just highlighting all those excesses on the other side. So John, what are you what are you working on now? What is next for you? What can we anticipate? Um, yeah. Well, I've been thinking about doing a book about sort of you know the less war on science, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm writing for City Journal. I'm, I'm doing more stuff. I, I'm, I'm writing more about COVID too, about you know, what it's done to you know to science there, um, and uh, you know, and I'm I'm kind of um, you know, the hard thing about the crisis crisis is it's hard to, to get people to believe in this during a crisis. You know, you, you know, it's hard. I mean, during the COVID thing, people get so hysterical that it's hard to tell them, you know, this really isn't the end of the world. This, you know, and put things in perspective. And, you know, that's the, I mean, that's the ultimate solution to the crisis crisis and, to, and, and, to, and also just to feeling better about the world is don't pay so much attention to bad things. Don't pay so much attention to the news. Look at the big picture, look at long-term trends. There's, you know, almost, you know, virtually every measure of human welfare is getting better. But, you know, most of us, and it's a terrible problem in, in, in rich countries, you know, that um, in developing countries, people tend to be optimistic about whether the world's getting better because they've seen this incredible progress against poverty and hunger. But in, 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 in the United States and Europe, you know, the, the, the majority of people think the world's getting worse. You know, there was, there was one poll where uh, preteen kids in America, and they said, what's the earth going to be like uh, when you grow up? And one in three said, uh, uh, thought that the earth would not exist. And it's terrible that we're, you know, teaching people, you know, you know, raising kids to be so pessimistic when, you know, things are getting better. I have so many reasons I, I feel to be optimistic, particularly given the work that we do connecting with, with young people um, and helping them uh, celebrate and employ the principles of objectivism, of reason, individualism, productivity, achievement in their own lives, and they are uh, they are so hungry to to learn and uh, searching for for answers. And so um, I, I definitely see a generational difference that uh, you know as we as we get older, uh, we tend to to be more more pessimistic. So that's part of how I get to recharge my battery. So you actually see, you know, see younger, younger people being uh, more optimistic then? Well, so at least the, the younger people that, <laughs> that are part of uh, our, our book club and part of our Atlas Advocates, uh, yes, they, they, they are um, uh, angry and upset about, um, about politics, but, uh, but I, I'm, I'm less seeing them necessarily being um, optimistic than them being curious and them uh, being idealistic and them um, being engaged. Mm -hmm. So to, to me, it's it's not necessarily whether they're fearful or not, but yeah, I'd say there's That's good. a lot of, of young objectivists who uh, 
who are are motivated and, and reading and wanting to find ways to to improve their lives. So, um, well, I think that's a great example of how um, you know basically a, a libertarian and objectivist outlook. But you know, by looking at what individuals can do and focusing on that instead of victimhood, instead of that, does improve your personal outlook. Um, and um, and I think you know that uh, I remember Julian Simon, who was a great debunker of. You know, the idea you know, during the energy crisis, when in, you know, in the, in the 70s, when everyone said, oh, my God, we're going to run out of oil and the industrial society is going to collapse. You know, he made this famous bet with Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren. about he said, pick any, you know, any resources you want, oil, you know, metals, anything like that. And I bet you that it will be uh, cheaper in the future than it is today. And, and so they bet in 1980, came through in 1990, they picked five medals and they lost. You know, it was a thousand dollar bet and they were wrong on every single one of them. And I remember that I was with Julian one Earth Day. It might have been in 1990, actually. Um, and, um, and there was a big rally on the mall. Of, oh my God, the, you know, the planet is dying. We're, you know, it's, it's terrible. We have to stop this. You know, catastrophe is right around the corner. We're not going to last. You know, it's always, in, you know, we have five years to act or the planet will never recover. And Julian was speaking at a um, symposium by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And uh, and it was across the street from the mall at a building there. And there were like 20 people there at it. And, you know, meanwhile, there's this mob on the mall just seeing, you know, this. And Julian's, you know, he was philosophical. And he said, you know, well, there may be more of them who were happier. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it's just a much better way to see the world. And, you know, and talking about young people, too, is that um, there's an interesting thing where, where, where people actually personally get more, uh, get happier as they get older. And that's really because of the negativity effect is very strong in young people because, you know, bad things are a great way to learn. And so it's important. It's really important to learn from your mistakes. You know, religions that have hell grow a lot more quickly than ones that don't because it's just it. it and uh so young people are very sensitive to bad. And I think that's why you do some of this with complete angst about, oh my God, the, you know, Greta Thunberg and these people about the planet's gonna die. Um, so they're very sensitive, but as people get older, they're less affected by bad things and they do learn more uh, to look at good things. Uh, they use nostalgia, which is, you know, we, in the book we talk about, that's a great tool for, for increasing positivity and with your partner too, or with your friends. It, Thinking about good things, it's a great way to boost the mood. So I think in that sense, older people do learn to get happier. And, and I hope that, you know, that everyone can too. And if they buy our book, they certainly will. <laughs> and I would say, uh, if, if John can do it, if I can do it, John is in New York City. I am in, at the moment, San Francisco, two of the places where uh, the, the lockdown uh, controls are strictest and the, the negative effects um, and consequences uh, have been felt the most um, strongly. If we can uh, find ways and reasons to be grateful and optimistic, uh, of course, being a newlywed, married to the most fat <laughs> woman on the face of the earth has to help, but if we can do it, so can you. So I want to uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks, thanks to all of you who, uh, who joined us today on Zoom, on YouTube. Uh, we're also going to put this up on Facebook. I want to encourage all of you to join me next week. I'm going to, uh, to chat with my friend Michael Walsh, who is the author of Last Stands. And if you enjoyed this, uh, this webinar and you enjoy the content by the Atlas Society, please consider uh, joining John and others uh, in supporting us by making a tax deductible donation. So thanks everyone. And John, give my love to Helen. Thank you, Jennifer. I will. Take care. Bye. Bye.